so. Welcome everyone. Uh, you got the recording going there. So welcome everyone to uh, this afternoon's study. It's afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, uh, to the Telford Muse Pro Prophecy Conference. And there isn't a lot of people here, but there's people online and people watching these videos. And of course, if we ask for God's presence, he will be here as well. So can we begin with a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here through thy spirit, the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, who promised to come to us and to bring us into unity with him and with each other. Lord, we need your presence every moment of every day. And we need your presence now in a special way as we open your word together, as we look at your providences and the way that you have been leading us as a people in the past and in the present. We ask, Lord, that you can work upon the heart of each person, that you can address the sins in our lives as light comes to us and brings conviction of sin. We ask, Lord, that also you can provide your power to overcome sin. We pray for our family and friends. We pray for the people in this movement, the people that we come in contact with each day. We're thankful for the way that you care for each one of us and for them as well. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last night I was awoken just prior to 2.30 by a thunderstorm. And uh, we get thunderstorms here in the prairies, uh, but this one was a little bit more powerful than some that I've heard recently. It's more like being in Arkansas almost. Uh, there's some pretty bad thunderstorms when we were there. Um, but it reminded me of God's power and that we need to ally ourselves with God because there's someone else who has power, but it does not compare with God's power. And we need God's power in our lives to overcome sin. We need him to teach us, to guide us, to correct us. Now, what we're looking at today, because we've been studying chronology, um, I have in the notes for those that have them, the title of this presentation is called Past and Present. Now, this is basically a study that I wrote called After July 18, 2020. And I was expressing what I believe that God was teaching us in that disappointment, if we want to call it that, of a prediction that was made based upon chronology. And so we're uh, touching on all these different chronologies, all of these different symbols. So Dwight presented to us uh, the Millerite line, and that line uh, simply was a line that we had, and it looks something like this in 2016, actually. You had 9-11, the Midnight Cry, and the Sunday Law, with a little tiny tick here called Midnight. Now, the reason why that occurred is that in our history, something is being unsealed. And what's being unsealed in our history that was sealed up in Millerite history? Revelation 10, what was sealed? Seven the seven thunders, right? When I came into this movement, in 2010, there was a couple of, well, maybe there was three websites that had variations of the Seven Thunders as their title. And they were addressing 
uh, this, the truths of this movement. And we used to talk a lot about the seven thunders. So the seven thunders, we believed, were seven way marks in Millerite history. But we did not fully understand these way marks. And what we came to understand is that the seven thunders were uh, the sealing up of Millerite history, and it's in our history that those thunders are unsealed, and they're unsealed how? How is a thunder in our history, one of the seven thunders, unsealed? Okay, so we experience a parallel to what the Millerites experienced. That is, um, so this is a statement, now it's in my notes, and it's on page 120 of the notes, so it's not actually in this presentation. Uh, but it addresses this question. It's from The Present Truth, November 4th, 1886, paragraph 7. It says, and when the light of the world, the sun of righteousness, had once risen, its illuminating rays were not only reflecting light to the future, but back through preceding generations, giving significance to the whole plan and purpose of God from Adam's day down through all patriarchs, the patriarchs and prophets, the old ceremonies were lighted up. These luminaries, which God had placed in the moral heavens, were never more to grow dim, but were to shine with clearer, steadier rays as the light from the cross of Calvary flashed upon the prophetic past. Now, this is another statement here at the end. This is on just before it. Uh, it says, um, there, is, there are those now living who in the studying of the prophecies of Daniel and John received great light from God as they passed over the ground where special prophecies were in process of fulfillment in their order. She then says, historical events showing the direct fulfillment of prophecy were set before the people and the prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And that's from 17 manuscript releases, uh, uh, page 1, paragraph 7. I believe that's what that means. So when we look at the present, we understand the present based upon the past. That is, there are past events that occurred. And this study that we are doing, uh, the main purpose of this study for this movement, is to understand the present. We want to have light for our feet. We want to know where God is leading, and we know that we can understand this based upon the past. Now, this study began... Um, on December 26, 2021, after our 777 days that we had this structure that we had, um, we began this study of understanding the lines. And uh, a week ago, this last Thursday, we, we had number 391. And so we had that's where we have stood in that study of understanding the lines. But about the last year of it, we were studying the book of Judges. And what we found in the book of Judges was that um, this line here, this 9-11 to the Sunday law, in our history, exists as a zoom-in or as a fractal or as a wheel within a wheel of a line that Ellen White has presented and which all Seventh-day Adventists at least used to know. And this was 
really quite simply this line. And this is what we need to understand. We have 1798 as the time of the end. Right? And this is the arrival of the first angel. And we'll see this in these notes. Ellen White is going to talk about the arrival of this angel. And she's going to use this in the context of the parable of the ten virgins. Right? So she says here, um, in uh, page 73 of the notes, when the third angel's message is preached, as it should be, power attends its proclamation. That type of power, greater power, than was demonstrated in the lightning and thunder last night. And this power becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power, or this this proclamation, uh, must be attended with divine power, or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time. And like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So what she is saying is that there is this message of the parable of the ten virgins. And we're just going to put this here. We're going to put 1844, right? And we're going to have this um, parable of the ten virgins. And she describes this in this next paragraph at the bottom of page 73. She says, in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, the experience of Adventists is illustrated by the incidents of an Eastern marriage. So when she says Adventists, who is she referring to? Millerites, right? That's what she's talking about. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The widespread movement under the proclamation of the first message answered to the going forth of the virgins, while the passing of the time of expectation, the disappointment, and the delay were represented by the tarrying of the bridegroom. Now, we of course put the time of the end here in 1798. But when she talks about the going forth of the virgins, I mean, you can put it back here to 1798, but to some degree, she's talking about this history um, in 1840, August 11th, 1840, to be precise, the end of Lich's prediction. And um, so she talks about this history as the going forth of the virgins. Now, I put 1844 here, but I'm going to um, do it this way. I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to put August 11th, 1840 over here. And then I'm going to put April 19, 1844 here. And then I'm going to put um, October 22 over here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the best way to do it. So it's not doing with anything up here, so I don't want you to get confused by that. So, of course, this is the arrival of the first message. But Ellen White talks about the movement, the history from 1840 to 1844. And this is the empowerment of the first angel. So, we know that the first angel arrives. There's an increase of knowledge. So, that's an increase of knowledge. And it's going to be formalized when Miller receives his credentials. Right? So that's the first angels formalized. That is, that message is put into place. 
and then it's going to be empowered. Now, these terms that we use, formalization, empowerment, they come from uh, other studies and other lines. And so we use this term. Ellen White uses this term, empowerment, right? Uh, but she uses other, well, she doesn't use, what she, what's the word she uses? Received impetus or something like that? Yeah, which is the same as empowered. So we're just using these these uh, terms for convenience sake. But then she says that there is the going forth of the virgins, right? And that definitely refers to this time. But I'm just going to, so it really starts here, but, you know, in a technical sense, but it does include this. So we're just going to call this the going forth of the, vir the virgins, Okay, so that's the going forth of the virgins, this history. And then you're going to have the tarrying time. So when does the tarrying time begin? Okay, so here you're going to have this tarrying. Okay, so I mean you could just say going forth of virgins here and tarrying here. Um, but in this tarrying we have midnight, the midnight cry, all these symbols here. But we're, we're just going to leave those out here. And this is going to be the arrival of the second angel, right? And then you're going to have, it's going to be formalized and empowered. And then you're going to have the arrival of the third angel. So Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White, the pioneers, all taught that the third angel arrived on October 22nd, 1844. Right? Now, often we talk about 1888, because 1888 is connected with the third angel's message. That's the General Conference in 1888, where A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner presented the message of righteousness by faith, which Ellen White recognized was uh, the third angel's message was righteousness by faith in verity. Now, when she says that, what some people think she means is that the first and second angel's messages aren't righteousness by faith, and only the third angel's message is. But what she's using this word verity is to mean in actuality. That means it, it is actually fulfilled. The first angel's message and the second angel's message are righteousness by faith. But they aren't righteousness by faith in verity. That is, the third step, this third angel's message, is about the transformation of a people to reflect Christ's character because he's not going to come until his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. So this is an important truth that the third angel arrived on October 22, 1844. But she says that this is going to continue. It's proclamation. Um, how does she put it here? Um, the proclamation of the first message answers to the virgins. And where is it? Ah. Uh, I read it, I just can't see it. Um, anyway, what she says is that this message continues, right? So this message is to be present truth, is what she says, till the close of time. So the third angel's message continues. Now, we're, we're going to look at some of these things as well. Uh, other statements in the spirit of prophecy. But the third angel comes and we know that she makes a statement that is going to be joined by the angel of Revelation 18. Right? And we sometimes call this the fourth angel, but the angel of Revelation 18 is the second angel. Right? And because the second angel's message is connected with the fall of Babylon. But Babylon has fallen. Protestants here were being tested and they closed their probation when Miller's predictions and his prophecy came to an end. And they went from 500,000 Adventists to 50,000. Right? So those Protestants were being tested here. And when they had this test here, in order to receive this, the light of the second angel, 
you have to receive the light of the first. And so they can't be benefited by the second angel. And if you're going to receive the third angel's message, you have to be benefited by the second. And by the first. And by the first, right? So all three messages are needed, right? She says a very similar thing about um, the decrees. Seventh-day Adventists have a parallel that they don't notice. They focus upon the third angel's message with the neglect of the first and second. And when it comes to the 2300 days, they focus on the third decree with the neglect to the first and second. And those three decrees that begin the 2300 days and the three messages that, be, that end the 2300 days are a parallel history. And much of the history that we have in looking at Millerite history is really, we're looking at what happened to literal Israel and we're seeing that it applies to spiritual Israel. Now it's getting a bit warm in here. I can see that eyes, lids are closing. But I'm going to try to keep you awake. And of course, I know some people are in other parts of the world are already asleep because they're going to watch this tomorrow. But um, this, this truth, understanding this, is the key to understanding the present. Right? Yeah. That is, if, if we're looking at, in this movement, if we're going to try to understand our experience, we really need to understand this history. And before we started this study of understanding the lines, on March 7th, the 1700th anniversary of the first Sunday law, we began a study called Examining the Foundations. And so what we did there is we looked at Millerite history and then we looked at what Jeff had taught. We looked at our firm Foundation Magazine uh, articles that, uh, uh, um, that he had published in the Time of the End magazine. And then we looked at... Um, future news newsletters, and we read also some of his early notes. And so what we had uh, was an understanding how God had led in Millerite history and how he's leading in our history. <clears throat> so the other thing then is Ellen White sees Revelation 18 as what event? What prophetic event is this? The mighty angel of Reg Revelation 18 comes down. And what event is it? What does she associate it with? Okay. Is that with the great buildings of New York falling down? No. So that's not what she associates it with. So Stephen says it's the Sunday law. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you need the microphone. In the quote that Dwight there referred to, mm -hmm. she connects it to when the Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. Mm -hmm. She connects, she quotes Revelation 18, mm -hmm. I think 1 to 3. And then in Great, great Controversy, uh, she mentions Revelation 18, she quotes 1 and 2, and then verse 4 as well. So Verse 4 is definitely the Sunday law. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, go on. So when the Lord will arise to shake terrible at the, the earth, earth, so I connect that to the close probation. So you can see there that Revelation 18 is um, a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, where in, in them quotes that she's referring to. So from at least from the Sunday law to the close probation, She's connecting. So that would be where she is, not their quote with the, okay. the buildings so, are falling down in 9-11. She's sort of at the end of that time period, mm -hmm. you know. But she's gone back previously, so it's a period of time, to the Sunday law. But in referring to the, the falling down of the buildings of New York City, I can see that, that there's a sort of a re recognizing some event that there's, you could even go even further before the Sunday law okay. you know, with that event. 
Right. So, Ellen White, I mean, she connects it to the Sunday Law, but the Sunday Law is not just a singular event, right? As most Seventh day Adventists think, one day they wake up, they open up their newspaper, at least in the 90s when we had newspapers, that's how we would think of it, and you're going to see Sunday Law. And you knew, well, I'm a Seventh day Adventist, I'm not going to be fooled or duped by this Sunday Law, I'm going to stand with Christ. But until that day happens, I'm just going to live my life as any other Seventh-day Adventist. You know, paying my tithe, going to church on Sabbath, you know, believing that I'm better than other people are because I believe the truth, right? So Seventh-day Adventists are not ready for the Sunday Law because they haven't experienced the first and second angel's messages. And they haven't experienced the third angel's message. Right? That's how we would understand it. So this history here, Ellen White calls the Sunday Law, but you can see it. It has all of this history that we are presently have gone through 9-11. So if we zoom in to this, this is what is the result. Right? That is, this isn't the history after the Sunday Law, per se, right? This is the history preceding the Sunday Law. So she's... (coughs) Excuse me. She says that the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So that means in order for this to occur, these messages have to be repeated. And we have statements where she says these messages have to be repeated. So what this is, Ellen White has this line which Seventh-day Adventists used to know. They would know that, well, Revelation 18, that's going to be connected to the Sunday law, and then you're going to have the loud cry, and then the close of probation, the seven last plagues, and the second coming, then the millennium, and then, you know, the, the resurrection of the wicked, and then the great white throne judgment, and then the destruction of the wicked. And, and that's, that's what Ellen White presents in the book, The Great Controversy. But what most Adventists don't know is that this history has to be repeated. And why does it have to be repeated? Because we have not been studying it as we should. Well, these messages have been rejected, right? Right. The church has rejected these truths. And Adventists, many of them don't know what the three angels' messages are. And even, even the people who claim to be the reformers going back to the old paths, many of them talk about the third angel's message only. We've even had it in this movement where people say, it's the third angel's message that we need to be preaching. But you can't be benefited by the third. If you have not been benefited by the first or the second. Exactly. So you have to be benefited by all three messages, just like all three decrees that commence the 2300 days, all three messages are needed. And since they were rejected, they're going to be repeated. So Millerite history is telling us about our history. Now, we have learned some things because when Dwight drew this up here, you know, we, he, put not, he didn't put 9-11 in Sunday Law at first. He put the dates in Millerite history. Right, so we had the you know the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month. And he had, of course, April nineteenth, July twenty-first at Boston, uh, August fifteenth at Exeter, and then October twenty-two, the Great Disappointment. So, so we had all of that that history, a Millerite history. But we know that Jeff had come to draw these way marks with this indication. And he developed that over time. Because originally, his line had three way marks only, and it always looked like this. And it would have 1989, Sunday Law, close of probation. Right? This is an early line of Jeff's, right? before 9-11. Right? Because there's no 9-11 here. But if you think about it, 
this was, as we zoomed into this Sunday law after 9-11, as we were passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, then 9-11 popped out. So what Jeff was doing is he was zooming into, so this was a zoom into the Sunday law, right? And then he zoomed into the Sunday law again, and then he had a line that looked like, um, like this, 1989, 9-11, the Sunday law. I don't know how many remember that, right? That, that's the line when I came into the movement in 2010, right? There, there, there was no midnight cry, right? No midnight. Um, now, we, we did start to put those things in there. So gradually we started to look at the history, and you look at some of these early charts, they, they, they lay out Millerite history and they start to put the, it together a little bit. But it, it's going to develop. And, and then the line, of course, develops to this, right? So this is the line. But we begin to zoom into this line even more. Now, one of the things that we need to see, so, and the reason why we need to see this is because it's true first, but also we can't understand our history unless we understand these truths. And it's the study of the book of Judges that really helped clarify what had happened to us, what Jeff had been doing, right? Now, we did these studies over a year, so that's five studies a week for more than a year. Um, you can watch them if you want. Take a long time. Um, and I don't suggest that you watch them at double speed or anything like that. Um, because you need to study. You need to understand things for yourself. And, and, and so we're putting together these studies so that you can get an overall picture of what we learn and you can test it. And so Iran is giving you these these analytical tools that we used, so you can you can try them and you can see, you can find things for yourself. And 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 I've always told people this, you know I would, I would say I found something, you know I was digging in the scriptures and I found something, this precious gem, that means something to me. But you need to find something that means something to you. And. Some of the things I share that, that I find are things that I, I don't generally share because they're, they're much more personal. Um, but when they become a part of the line, then, then I see I need to share them, right? But if they're just part of my own personal life, I don't need to, everybody doesn't need to know everything that I've ever found in, in these lines. But it doesn't mean that if you find it, you have to share it with everyone either. But sometimes these are significant and they're part of our testimony. That is, we need to dig in the scriptures for buried treasure that is our own. We have to appropriate these truths for ourselves. So, um, I erased all that stuff there. But <clears throat> what we, the, the thing that we had, as you know, is we had this line. 9-11. So when Jeff started to draw this line out, it started to look like something that didn't exist in Millerite history. And in Millerite history, you had this thing called Midnight and the Midnight Cry. And Ellen White parallels the Midnight Cry with the Loud Cry, right? And, and she's going to uh, parallel those events of Millerite history uh, with events in our history. Amen. Now, she... She takes the Sunday law, and she talks about the Sunday law, then the loud cry, then the close of probation, right? So I'll, I'll do this here. So Ellen White has this. She has the Sunday law, the loud cry, and then the close of probation, okay? And we say, well, the loud cry parallels the midnight cry, okay? That makes sense, right? We all understand that. But if that's the case, Jeff is going to do this. So he's going to have 9-11, and then he's going to have midnight. So we get it a little bigger as time goes on, because 
now we have four way marks instead of three in our main lines. And then we have the Sunday law. And then we still have the loud cry. And then we, um, and then we have the close of probation. And then we have, of course, you know, the seven last plagues and then the second coming, right, and all that stuff. Well, in mid if this is paralleling Millerite history, if the midnight cry is paralleling Millerite history, and it's paralleling the loud cry, get rid of that there. Um, how come we're putting it before the Sunday law? How come we're putting something that parallels the loud cry in Millerite history we're taking in our line and we're putting it before? Well, we know this is a repeat of history. So, so this is something that Jeff struggled with as he started to understand, is, as he started to zoom into these lines and get a, a better picture of a more detailed picture, let's say, of what we were going through because we were passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. He didn't quite understand what was happening. Now, we know that in this line, we have 1989, right? So you got 11.9 over here, 9.11, and, um, and this history here, 1989 to 9.11, you know, we would call this the first message, right? So the first angel's message arrives, parallels Millerite history. But we also had this. And this parallels the first angel empowered. I left the formalization out because we don't need it here in this slide. So this is, you know, August 11th, 1840. So when we first found 9-11, it was the empowerment of the first angel but then as time went on, Jeff put this as the arrival of the second angel. Now, he didn't draw them out separately like this. He had the same way mark, right? So he'd have his line, 9-11, but he'd have underneath it the first angel empowered and the second angel arriving. And so what was he doing when he was doing this? He said, well, we're bringing the messages together. But, but what he really was doing was zooming into this history, right? So he's zooming into the history of 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. But remember, what we ended up with was a new line, and we didn't know how to place this line. This line looked like this, 11-9, but this is 2019. And then we had another way mark here, We'll call it 18.7, right? Should I do it that way? November, I'll do it the other way. We'll call it 7.18. And then we had, of course, uh, uh, 12.25. And this is going to be 2020. And this is going to be 2021. And this is a period of 777 days. It's like... Why did we end up with a line like this? I mean, after all Jeff had done, we ended up with this line that looked like this. And, and this way mark here, what, what did we mark this as? As a symbol? We didn't say it was going to happen on this day, but we marked this as what? The Sunday law, right? And there was so many different things. It's the 20th day of the ninth month, and that comes from Ezra chapter 10. Um, and we understood even this one, like we had Raffi and Paneum and so forth. But we also understood this to be uh, connected to 9-11, right? And, and so we would do different things with these lines, but we had no idea what, where, where we were zoomed in, what, uh, what do they call that, what the magnification was, right? Are we at one times, two times, 10 times, 20 times, 200 times? We didn't have a clue, right? We had all of these way marks and no way to sort them out. Now, we came to understand when we looked at Judges chapter 2, right? So this is going to be um, leading into uh, the next study, right? And, and so we're going to get there uh, in the next study. So I'm just seeing how much time I have. So I started at what time? I started at... Uh, 12.45, so i got another 20 minutes, right? <clears throat> now, 
So I'm, I'm going to address this. I'm going to just cover some of the stuff that I'm, uh, for my next study because we're going to look at it. So what we did in the book of Judges is we zoomed into this way mark, the second angel arrived, and that we found that we were in a history with this structure, and we're thinking this is the Sunday law, right? And we're, we're talking about the national Sunday law. It's going to be coming. It's connected with this. And we expected Nashville, right? right. Um, even here we expected Islam initially, because when we talked about Rafi, it was going to be about Islam, but later on it turned about this conflict between, the Soviet, the, between Russia and the United States. But that, that didn't materialize. And we were repeating Millerite history in what way? How were we repeating Millerite history in what we were doing? We were repeating them in their... Order. Okay, order. But also in their mistakes. Right. right? We were repeating the same mistakes. We're going over the same ground that they had gone over. But what did we have that they didn't have? We had a way of understanding our mistakes. Right? I mean, they did partially. But the seven thunders in Millerite history, their experience is sealed up. Right? Correct. And we used to think, at least I used to think, because the statement about the seven thunders Ellen White has in uh, 7a, there's a statement where she talks about the mighty angel of Revelation 10, and she talks all about the seven thunders, and time is no longer, and, and I used to study that over and over, those paragraphs, because I was addressing uh, people who were time-setting, right, and showing that there's, you know, no more time after 1844. So, so I'd studied that a lot. Um, but in... The seven thunders, it wasn't unsealed on October 22, 1844, was it? Now, I used to think that, well, it was unsealed as they came to understand their disappointment. But it's not unsealed in that history. Because in order for it to be unsealed, you have to pass over the same history. That's what we found when we read that one statement. As we go through fulfilled prophecy we then comprehend what happened in the past and we have light for our feet now that they didn't have because they, they didn't have their mistakes to learn from yet. We have their mistakes, right? right. So, so God is allowing this movement at the present time uh, to experience error. He had the Millerites make a mistake on the 1843 chart. God held his hand over this corner of the chart. And the date 1843 here and here, those are incorrect. Right? These two 1843s are correct, by the way, because 1798 minus 45 is 1843, and the 45 comes from here, and this is correct. Right? And this is just another example, the 508 and the 1335. So the 1290 and the 1335 um, those are correct. The 1335 ends April 18th at sunset in 1843. That's the end of the year, Jewish year 1843. So it ends in 1844. So these are correct. But those ones up there aren't because they, they don't recognize that there's no zero year. The math has a zero, but BC to AD does not. So they made mistakes. They made mistakes... What did they think August 11th, 1840 was going to be? It was the end of the sixth trumpet. Correct. And what was going to sound then when the, the seventh trumpet was going to begin to sound? And, and this was going to mark the close of probation. So even though they believed Jesus was coming back in 1843 or 1844, they believed that probation was going to close here or, or shortly after here. Right? They weren't looking for a close of prob they weren't looking for the second coming uh, to just happen out of nowhere because they read the Bible. What does the Bible say happens before the second coming? What are some things that happen? Seven last plagues. <laughs> right? So you got the seven last plagues. So 
All of that understanding we as Seventh-day Adventists have about things that are going to happen before the second coming of Christ. The Millerites had that understanding too because they got it from the scriptures. So the idea that Jesus is just going to one day come was not a part of their teaching. They believed probation had to close and then the seven last plagues would have to fall and then the, the righteous dead would have to be resurrected and then, and then Christ would would come and all that pierced him, they would see him come. And then there would be a thousand years, right? That Satan would wander the earth. And then, and then you would have, you know, all those other events, the great white throne judgment and everything. So Millerites understood that. But what happened when this, this date passed? Had probation closed? Did they stop preaching to the wicked? No. So... But were they looking for the seven last plagues in 1844? Were they looking for the seven last plagues before October 22, 1844? No. The closest they got was, when did they close probation? Many Adventists believe that probation had closed prior to October 22. What's that? October 13th. Right? And we know October 13th, that's the, the fall of Babylon. Right? So they had marked that because it's the first day of the seventh month when the Feast of Trumpets begins. And so they marked that as the close of probation. Right? And then after October 22, they moved the close of probation. Well, it, it closed there. The shut door was then. And, and you know, we're just in this waiting time. You know, the bride's going to come. The bridegroom's going to come from the wedding. And so all of these things that they experienced, we experienced. But we have their history to learn from. And, and this is what is being neglected in this movement at the present time. Right? We can, can we agree with that? That We have some lip service to it, but is that what we are studying overall in this movement? No. And so if we don't know the mistakes that the Millerites made, clearly, we're not going to know what mistakes we're making, and we're making mistakes... We know because we made a prediction and it didn't come to pass, right? right? And so we know one thing we know is we can't set dates, right? The Millerites learned that after October 22nd, 1840. At least some of them did. Right. But, and some of us have learned that. But doesn't mean we don't measure the time. It's because part of watching and waiting is looking at the events that are happening and recognizing the footsteps of an approaching God, right? Amen. We're looking for Christ to come. We need to be watching and waiting. Watching and waiting is not sitting on your couch, eating potato chips, and watching movies, right? Okay. You know, it's not going out and socializing as a Seventh-day Adventist and talking about, on Sabbath, talking about the latest football game or cricket match or whatever it may be, Right? or some world uh, heavyweight fighter or welterweight or whatever it is, the things that the world are interested in, those who are watching and waiting, they're sighing and crying for the abominations done in the land. Right? right. So, and we're, we're watching and waiting. We're watchmen on the walls of Di- Zion. We have to recognize when the enemy is coming and we have to give a warning. And so God has given us Millerite history to learn from. Now the history of the judges, because that's what we're going to be looking at in this series of studies. And that's why I asked Stephen to give us some of the chronology, because if I started dealing with the chronology, I'm going to get tangled in the web of details, uh, because there's so many of them and they're so interesting. But I don't want to be dealing with all of the chronological issues. But you need to understand the chronology. We need to understand it. Because one of the things I found in, in the way that we have studied is when, that I, when I um, start to put together the pieces of these stories and I connect it with our history and with our lives, it becomes meaningful. We draw it on a line. And everybody should be doing these lines. You need to draw these things out for yourselves. You need to use these tools, these analytical tools. 
You need to have an e-sword, preferably with the spirit of prophecy and all the different Bibles and the Hebrew and dictionaries and all those things, at least. You don't have to have all of them. But we need to know how to use these tools. We need Strong's, uh, you know, how to, to use Strong's concordance, right? And we know, need to know how to compare Scripture with Scripture. We need to know how to do a word search and to look at the original, where that word shows up in the Bible, the law of first mention. And we need to know the stories of the Bible because if we're studying the Bible and we don't even know what it's talking about, who's, who's being referenced, because that was my experience before I came into this message, I thought I knew the Bible, but I didn't really know it, right? I had a, a sketchy understanding of it. And knowing the scriptures is knowing Christ, right? That's how we come to know Christ. We study the scriptures. And, and those stories become real and alive. It's, we, we see in those, those individuals, when we read about Ezekiel, when we read about um, you know, Christ, you, and and his his experience, we start to see, we start to feel what the people who were there feeling because we're going over the same ground that they went over. We're having the same experiences. We can understand the experience of the Millerites because we're experiencing what happened after October 22, 1844. We see the conflicts that occur within the movement. And some people don't like how they use the word conflict, but it is because it's the great controversy. It's a conflict between Christ and Satan. And it's happening between brother and sister in this movement, brother and brother, sister and sister. And it's happening in our own hearts in a battle that Satan has for us. He knows our weaknesses. And we see pride and envy and jealousy and evil speaking, evil surmising. We, we gather up stones to cast out our enemy rather than to, to heal the wounds, many of those wounds that we have caused. So this is what this, these studies are about. We can look at it as just chronology. It's a bunch of numbers. It's a bunch of dates, um, but in reality, it's God speaking to us. <clears throat> now, um, I'm just going to read a couple of statements more from these notes. This is what we need to heed. She says, as the churches refuse to receive the first angel's message... They rejected the light from heaven. By opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. We have to be careful that we do not do that. She says, near the close of the second angel's message, I saw great light from heaven shining upon the people. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and glory which attended the message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So those are statements from the uh, spirit of prophecy, you know, from early writings 237, 238 and early writings 239. Now, this is another thing, which this movement, we know this quote the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Can you locate them? Can Seventh-day Adventists locate the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages? Many yeah. Not a peg or a pin is to be removed. Have the pegs and pins been removed in Adventism? Most certainly. Yes. Have they been removed in this movement? Do we know how to place them? <clears throat> no human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. The Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. One is as essential as the other. Right? The first and second messages were given in 1843 and 1844. So 
Sometimes she puts 1843, but that's really the end of that first message. In 1844, that's going to be uh, the second message arriving in 1844. And we are now under the proclamation of the third. That's the third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844. But all three messages are still to be proclaimed. Are we proclaiming them? Do we understand them? <clears throat> so this is the one statement that that I was talking about. This is um, from Early Writings 277, where I talk about how that angel, the other angel, is going to join the third angel and it's going to swell to a loud cry. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. And then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. That's what I heard last night with that thunder and I saw that lightning, that power and force. And, and this, we talk about the seven thunders. I heard a lot more than seven thunders last night. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory, just like the flashes of lightning. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. He cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitations of devils. That's the second angel's message, right? right. And the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon as given by the second angel, is repeated. With the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. Remember, in the, when this, in the three angels' messages, when the second major, angel's message happens, is there a call to come out of Babylon in Revelation 14? Yes. No, there isn't. Babylon has fallen, but there's no call to come out. Now, the Millerites did connect that angel of Revelation 18, and said Babylon has fallen, come out of her. But in Revelation 14 itself, there is no call to come out of Babylon. Right? That's Revelation 18. Okay? But because of the corruption in the churches, that's why. And we can see that the corruption in the churches is much worse than it was back, we would just think, you know, they're very conservative and nice Christians back then, generally speaking. There's exceptions of some of the churches, of course. And if we looked at the person's, people's personal lives, we would see that corruption was there. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mentions, right, of corruption. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And we know the loud cry comes after the Sunday law. Right? So we know if we're repeating Millerite history that we have to be repeating it to the very letter. And so we need to understand these truths. And I believe that the book of Judges gives us this understanding. Now it's it's a rather going to be a rather technical study. There's going to be lots of dates, lots of new concepts and ideas for those who have not been following the morning studies. We're going to be looking at things like the Hebrew numbers and Capricar's constant and all of these different symbols and, and how n these Hebrew numbers of names represent spans of time. And we had done that earlier with the numbering of the tribe of Israel. The numbers given represent spans of time and that we could connect dates in these amazing ways. Now we also know that we have a future date that we're going to be dealing with. And I'm going to be doing a series um, Friday night, uh, Sabbath morning. It's going to be like the sermon part of it, I think, um, for Sabbath. And then uh, Sabbath evening, right? So it's going to be a two ex extra at the end of our regular time of studies on Friday and Saturday, Right? And then I'm going to be not doing this presentation on the Sabbath afternoon. I'm going to be doing the midst of the week. And that study was a study I did in 2018. 
And that study pointed to a date in the future. And we need to understand what that means. It's April 5th, 2030. And we're not predicting an event on that date because we don't believe that we can set time. But it's, we believe God gave it to us for a reason and we need to understand what that is. So, so that's what we will be doing in this series of studies. Um, any, any final questions before we close with prayer? Any ideas? Or, does it seem pretty clear what we're doing? I've tried to make things as clear as I can. Okay, uh, you have a question. Somebody has a question. Okay, so I'm going to answer that question. And I also need to answer another question, because somebody mentioned, I'm not going to really answer it, but I'm going to refer to the answer to it, about Miller had for uh, the crucifixion of Christ 33 AD. And, and I'm going to be addressing that in the midst of the week study. Right? So, so that's going to be addressed there, why Miller chose 33 AD and why, why it's wrong but not why it's wrong, because completely, because there's something in that, in the mistakes that we make, God is actually giving us light. Right, and we will see that. And then the other question about measuring time and time setting, well, that's really simple. Measuring time is looking at dates and seeing that there's a structure, but time setting is saying, here's a date in the future, and on this date, this is going to happen. A symbolic date, nothing may happen on that date. That date may come and go, and nothing associated with that date. But that date, as a symbol, gives witness to our history presently. So measuring the time is not time setting. Because uh, the expression actually comes from uh, Second Esdras. can't remember the passage. But it says, you measure the time that when it is past you'll know it was the time. That we can see God's leading in past events. Now, there's events that are still going to be in the future. And God sometimes gives us those dates in the future. And, and then when we pass those events, do we, see, do, do we know what was going to happen? Do we even know when we pass that event what happened? Not always. Not always. Sometimes that event comes and goes... And later on, we see, oh, here is what what that date was about. But if we said, you know, something is going to happen in the future, and, you know, it's going to happen on this date, that's time setting. So it's very simply to see the difference between the two. Um, But I know there's a temptation when we have a date in the future for somebody to say, I think it's going to be on, this event's going to happen. And, And I see it again and again. People send me, all kinds of studies, they got some date that they think this is going to happen or it's going to be significant, and it comes and goes. And sometimes those dates are significant, but they don't even know about the event because I know about it because it wasn't something that actually addressed them at all, right? It wasn't something that addressed the world, but they were right in, in a sense in measuring it. But to say that when that date happens, this is going to happen, that's a danger. And we know we can't do it. We know from personal experience and from the direct testimony in the spirit of prophecy. And all through this time, before November 9th, before July 18th, I've had consistent belief in Ellen White's counsel against time setting. I did not believe that we were time setting when we looked at those dates. Because Ellen White says, we can't know the time for the second coming, the close of probation, the Sunday law, or any promise of special significance. And we've proved it, that we can't. Even when we have those dates witnessed to multiple ways through Scripture. So we need to understand that. We need to understand what that means to us. Okay, thank you for those questions, and uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, We are so thankful for each person who has participated in these studies. We know that some are up very late um, watching these. And um, we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to teach us and help us to understand your truth. 
um, be with us in uh, our time that we have um, to fellowship or sleep or whatever it is that we need to do. And we ask that you can keep us, that your angels can watch over us uh, before we, beca- while we are waiting to come together for the studies this afternoon. Thank you for hearing our prayers, for the answer to Angela's prayer, and uh, that she can have glasses that she can see. And we ask, Lord, that we can have spiritual insight, that we can see wonderful things in your word. Be with us throughout this camp meeting and this special time together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.